This morning we're going to be in Romans chapter 6. Uh, we're going to be here throughout this entire part of this series all through the month of January uh, that, that we are calling uh, Fresh Start. And if uh, you're going to share anything on uh, social media, uh, we would ask you to use the hashtag Fresh Start series. It's, it's on the screen. It is, it is at the bottom of your handouts. Hopefully you got some of those to just uh, uh, help you to just follow along. Uh, with uh, today's message and to hopefully bring some encouragement to you. Uh, as, as we start this uh, new year, uh, I'm sure many people look forward to it in the hopes of getting a fresh start. For, for, for some of us, uh, 2019 may not have been one of the best years for us. Good news is, it's a new year. We get a fresh start. And I think that we've also got to consider uh, where we are in our faith walk with Christ to make sure that complacency in faith doesn't set in. And so perhaps we need to look at a fresh start in our faith. And our uh, text for the entire series that we're going to go over for the next several weeks is found in Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 6. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. Verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. This is an entire uh, scripture that is part of us as believers in Christ, realizing and recognizing that there's got to be a different way that we live our life when we confess Jesus as Lord. There's one particular phrase in this uh, portion of text that we're going to be focusing on. Offer every part of yourself to him. Today we're going to be talking about uh, thoughts. Scripture says a lot about our thoughts. We're also going to be looking at several other things over the next few weeks. But today I want to start this series with what can we do to make sure that we're getting a fresh start in our thoughts, because listen, what happens from here on out is either going to happen or not happen based on the result of our thoughts. Scripture says a lot about our thoughts, our, our, our uh, mindset, because this is where, if, even if we go back to the Garden of Eden, Eve never ate of the fruit unless she thought about doing it first. So that's why we're starting here. Before we get anywhere else, we've got to start here. Leading up to Ephesians chapter 4, Paul has written to the church of Ephesus about some powerful principles of salvation in Christ. The blessings of God and the results of spiritual salvation concerning releasing us from the spiritual death. Paul encourages them that what he's writing and salvation to Christ is going to bring reconciliation to Christ and that God's wisdom will be revealed. Here's where he hits in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 20. He said, but that isn't what you learned about Christ. If you're wondering what that is, go, go read it. Go back and check it out. 
since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Instead, get a fresh start in your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. So if we're to take off the old and put on the new, it has to start in our mind. No matter what stage in life that we are in, our thoughts are the starting point. Regardless if we're young in faith or we've been doing this for a really long time, regardless if we're uh, 10, 20, 60, 70, or 38, everything has to be able to come back to our thoughts. And this is where, before we're going to get to the new that God wants us to be in, we've got to be willing to get rid of the old. Thoughts affect every single aspect of your life and my life. Our homes are affected, our relationships are affected, our health is, in, is impacted by thoughts, our jobs are impacted by thoughts, emotions are impacted by thoughts. Perhaps you've heard this before, watch your thoughts, they become words, watch your words, they become actions, watch your actions, they become habits, watch your habits, they become character, watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Starts in the thoughts. Many people have already made some New Year's resolutions that they're not going to keep. <laughs> some of you are like, done lost it. Here's, here's why that is. The reason people quit something new isn't because it's hard, but because the old way was easy. It's not that starting something new is so hard and so difficult. It's just that the old way was easy. The old way was familiar. The old way was comfortable. But it doesn't mean that we should stay where we were. Tony Robbins said this, Change happens, change happens when the pain of staying the same is greater than the pain of change. When the pain of staying the same is greater than than the pain of change. The Bible tells us the same thing over and over is that we've got to have a desire to continually move forward in our faith even when it seems difficult. I spoke last week a little bit on change for the church and what it's been like and what it's going to look like and that's all, all really part of this but also change within Ourself, personal change. Listen, God desires us to change. It's not that we have to change for God to love us, but that God loves us too much to see us stay the same. It's not that we have to change for him to love us. He, he loves us the way that we are. Scripture tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, but he loves us too much to leave us there. So a fresh start with our thoughts requires knowing that you are what you think. They are who we thought they are. Knowing that you are what you think. What if from today forward through the end of the year, you would proclaim a life free of negative thinking? when it impacts you especially. So what am I talking about here? Negative thinking. It's pretty simple. Any thought that does not include faith, any thought that does not include God, any thought that is contrary from God's word, what if we determined that that was going to be our new way of thinking? Worry is sim can be simply defined as thinking about the future without faith. There, there are people who feel like they can count on the person that they work with more, they, more than they can count on God. They don't really worry about what he's doing or what she's doing, but 
but tend to worry about different things going on in our life. Bitterness is thinking about the past without faith. All negative thoughts are thoughts that leave God out. Thoughts of revenge, thoughts of lust, thoughts of rebellion, thoughts of anxiousness, thoughts of worry. All of those are leaving God out. Here's the big caution about our thoughts is that we've got to understand that Satan claims territory in faithless thoughts. Satan claims territory in those faithless thoughts. Now, don't confuse negative thoughts with spiritual attacks. It's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about spiritual attacks. Now, I will also say, say this. There are a lot of people who think that they're under a spiritual attack and all that they're doing is walking around in negative thoughts. I'm not taking anything away from the attacks of the enemy, that they happen and they do happen. But there are times that the enemy is attacking simply because of negative thoughts rather than fearless faith. He's attacking you because you've given him room to attack. He attacks us in those negative thoughts because we've allowed him to come in. Are we worried about the future? Are we worried about what is happening in the Middle East? Are we worried about what is happening with new laws? Are we worried about all of these things? Are we worried about the economy? Are we worried about our financial security? Are we worried about just the country in general? If you're not careful, those negative thoughts will take over. And they will begin to cause you to try and defend those negative thoughts at the cost of people around you. If you're not careful, you will defend some of those negative thoughts, thoughts without faith. You will defend some of those so much so that it puts a blemish on you and it puts a blemish on Jesus because you're not being the representation of Jesus that we need to be. Don't dwell on the past so much that it drowns your future. Don't dwell on the past so much that it drowns your future. It's done with, it happened, we get it. But if your focus is there and not what is happening, then it's going to, to drown out the great things that God has for you. I don't know how many times that I have warned my kids about walking through somewhere busy, looking behind them and walking. Some of you are like, yeah, I know what you're saying. Why? Because as, as you're looking behind you, you're not aware of what's in front of you. So let's not be all focused on the past. Most things that you and I struggle with, they're not new. Most of those things aren't new. Now we can say perhaps sometimes that there is perhaps some medical condition that comes up. I will just ask you this. Is it something new or is it a result of the past? Is it something new or, or is it the result of not taking care of ourselves physically, not taking care of ourselves emotionally, not taking care of ourselves the way that we're intended to. Most things that we struggle with, they're not new. They are old. Marriages that are struggling are oftentimes because of things from the past. Here's another thing that we've got to understand about if we want this fresh thought process and this fresh start in our thoughts for 2020 is that a battle is taking place in our minds. There's a battle taking place. It's the same battle that has been uh, waged from the beginning of time between Satan and mankind through Adam and Eve. It's the same battle. It was not a physical battle that Adam and Eve fell to. It was not necessarily a spiritual battle. It started in their mind. It started because the enemy was able to take something that sounded familiar to them and just twist it a little bit. 
there's a battle taking place in our minds. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5 says this, for, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and, and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. I want to focus on one word in there. Maybe you need to write this beside it in your notes. If you've got your Bibles there, circle it, highlight it, whatever you need to do. Just don't let Pastor Ricky see it. It's, it's the word strongholds. It's the word strongholds. Satan is relentlessly trying to establish strongholds in our minds. He starts with maybe just a little bit of a foothold. But his goal is to get a stronghold. It's to not just have a piece of us, but to have all of us. These strongholds that are there. The foothold begins with a thought that is planted in our minds that we accept. The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. He might have tried to present the opportunity or present the thought, but you're the one that let that happen. Because in order for, for that stronghold to happen, we have to cooperate with Satan. Satan. In order for that stronghold to be established, we have to cooperate with Satan. Now, I'm not saying, you know, that we're sitting around, you know, dark room, candles, all of this stuff cooperating with, with Satan. That's not what I'm saying. But whenever that thought comes in, we are cooperating with him. Accepting negative thoughts and revisiting them over and over causes the sinful thought to become a stronghold, an area where Satan has claimed territory in your mind when you visit it over and over and over and over again, rather than taking up arms and letting Satan know that he is not going to be victorious. In preparing for this message, and in other times as I've looked at different, different truths about thoughts and the words, come across a a woman by the name of Dr. Caroline Leaf, author of Who Switched Off My Brain. In one of these videos, she says that within four days, we are capable of changing the way our brain functions or what goes through it. She calls negative thinking toxic thoughts. Speaking of the chemical imbalance that takes place in the brain that was created for, for positive thinking, the repeated toxic thoughts, she calls thorns. She calls them thorns in the brain. It is so powerful what happens within our minds. Whether we're going to live our life for God to its fullest or whether we're going to just hold back a little bit. It's so powerful because of what happens within our minds. She says this, every time the person revisits that thought, more negative chemicals will be released and the thorn will grow. What she's calling a thorn, I think we can look at Scripture that this is the stronghold. She says, one thought won't cause that chemical thorn, but repetitive negative thoughts build up a chemical stronghold in the brain. Strongholds of sinful thinking eventually lead to sinful actions. Strongholds of sinful thinking eventually leads to sinful actions. We don't commit sin because it just happened. If someone loses their temper, there's probably a buildup of angry thoughts that have been happening within their minds. When I talk to people who are, they are determined to divorce their spouse, they usually have a handy list of all of the bad things that that person has ever done. It didn't just up and happen one day. There's usually a list of these things. They've rehearsed that list so well that they probably haven't memorized. No one has ever fallen into an affair. 
there's thoughts that happen about that other person. Know anyone who constantly gossips or whines or grumbles or complains? Their brains are filled with bitterness, filled with discontent. Our job is to break down those strongholds by what the Word tells us. Take every thought captive for Christ. Take every thought captive for Christ. Sometimes we, we want to take the easy way out and, say, and you know, then act like somehow our thoughts are beyond our control. They just keep popping in my head. There's nothing I can do. God has called us to battle. He has called us to battle. He has commanded us to take the sinful thought captive and to break down the strongholds that are in our minds. A fresh start with our thoughts requires knowing that you have the greatest weapon. Maybe as you're sitting there, you're like, man, pastor, if, if only there was an example in the Bible of someone who is able to do what you're talking about. If only there was someone in there. His name's Jesus. Okay, in case you're wondering. His name's Jesus. Before he started his public ministry, he was tempted in the wilderness. Satan was trying to throw some thoughts in. He was trying to plant some thoughts. The period of temptation was a spiritual battle. It was a battle of the mind. And Jesus used a, an incredible weapon. Now, I'm in Oklahoma now. And I understand something about how people enjoy their guns. <laughs> Didn't expect that question in the interview, but I got it. <laughs> Pastor Bill, what are your thoughts on the Second Amendment? <laughs> to which I answered, I can either tell you I support it, or I can tell you that as I answer that question, I've got a 9 millimeter on my back right now as we speak. <laughs> That's what they wanted to hear. Now, I can tell you that it is not wise of anyone who wants to use a weapon to only use it when they feel threatened. Because that could be years. But you've got to be trained with that weapon. You've got to shoot round after round after round after round after round. So why is it that we think all of the sudden, whenever I feel an attack from the enemy coming, then I'm going to start reading the Word? Instead of having the Word ingrained deep within us, that whenever the attack from the enemy comes, we don't have to Google it. We don't have to get our app out. We have got it memorized because we have done what the Word says. I've hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your Word in my heart that when that thought comes, I take it captive. I get rid of it with the Word so that I don't have to sin. Listen, it is not a sin problem that we have. It is a lack of Word problem that we have. Because more word will be less sin. Jesus, Jesus told Satan each time, it is written. It is written. Jesus had to use God's word to cut through the lies of Satan. Too often, though, I think the believers want to try to reason with Satan. I'm not about trying to reason with him. I'm more about trying to resist him. And when I don't do well at that, I like to remind him of who my father is. I like to remind him of his future. Because, yes, the attacks are going to come. 
I'm not going to, to try to sit there and reason. I'm not even going, going to try to sit there and say, well, I'll go ahead and give in to this thought, give in to the, this, this temptation that will lead to sin, and then I'm going to go to God and ask for forgiveness. That's called cheap grace. You are walking a very dangerous line if that's your thought process. That I'm going to do this. I'm going to watch this. I'm going to be with this person. I'm going to just go and do whatever I want. And I'm going to do all of this stuff. And then whenever I feel the time is, you know, before I die, I'll ask God to forgive me. You're playing with fire and you're going to get burnt. But we have to know that we didn't see Jesus try to argue with Satan, try to reason with Satan. We just seen him use the word of God. So the same can be for us too. Hebrews chapter 4 says, says that the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Wow, Pastor, I didn't know that the Word of God had so much to do with thoughts. That's because God knows that that is where sin will originate, is in our thoughts. And He said that He's given us this. What we gather from this scripture and throughout so many others similar like it to support it is that the way to take sinful thoughts captive is to fill your mind with God's Word. There is, there is a very good reason that we can see marriages, some that are so strong and some that seem to be struggling all the time. I venture to say two things. One is that one of them has a pretty good diet of God's word. The other one does not. And I will say that the Say that one marriage has a pretty, pretty good dose of, I'm not going to keep this PG, a pretty good dose of satisfaction, and the other one does not. That there is a pretty good dose of uh, still having that same flirting and things that happened early in the marriage and the other one doesn't. Amy and I have, have had some people wonder at times if we've only been married for a couple years. It's been a lot longer than that. Say, wow, you guys act like you guys have only been married a short time. And that's because I found nothing in my premarital counseling that said that we ever need to act any differently. And there's a reason that uh, I will uh, say things in public so that people know I am mad about my wife. I'm crazy about her. She was walking up the bleachers the other night at, at, at the basketball game. And I'm like, hey, what's up, girl? I'll holla at you. <laughs> all, I was trying to set a good example for all those students. <laughs> that, man, Man that's, man, that's Will and Ryan's mom and dad. They talk like that? Yes, we do, all the time. I remember one day at football practice, Amy came over to football practice. Will loves when I tell this story. He hates it, which is why I tell it. And Amy's walking by, and I'm like, hey, Will. And the whole team looks at me because coach just yelled, hey, Will. Your mom's pretty hot. There's a healthy dose of that in our marriage. And I would venture to say that other marriages that are struggling don't have a lot of that. Because nothing says that that ever has to end. Because my thoughts are toward my wife. My thoughts are toward God. And the more thoughts that I put on God, the more that he helps me to be a better husband. Because I didn't have a good example growing up. But I've got a great father that has shown me all of these things. Having fresh thoughts takes more than just sitting in church once a week. 
It takes more than just coming here on Sundays. It takes more than just getting a notification or an email on our phone. It takes diving into God's word every day on our own. It also means diving into God's word with other believers on Wednesday nights or during life groups or during men's meetings or women's meetings or youth meetings and youth conferences and all of those things. It takes more than just coming in here on Sunday and checking it off. Listen, your thoughts are not going to be what they need to be for you to pursue faith if it's just a once a week type thing. Whenever we meditate on God's word, we are undergoing spiritual surgery in a sense, an operation that separates good from evil, an operation that separates self from faith. God's word reveals what thoughts and ideas are of the flesh and what is of the spirit. How do you know this? Because whenever you're reading something in the Word and you're like, I don't like what that says, it's probably something that you're struggling with in your life. It's probably something that the Holy Spirit is trying to say, hey, do I have your attention now? It is in my Word. Do I have your attention now? Let me just kind of drive it home with this final scripture in Philippians chapter 4. It says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Remember what I challenged you on in the beginning? Will you look in 2020 to not have negative thoughts? We're ending with the scripture here because truth is of God. Nobility is of God. Righteousness is of God. Purity is of God. Love is of God. And being admirable in the eyes of those around us because they see God in us, that is of God. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy. And this is not the excellent that we understand in the English. This is Whatever is going to be righteous, whatever is going to line up with the word of God, whatever is praiseworthy, think on such things.